lock and load on these presentations and create them in advance and hand them over to the AD people. There's always last minute changes. And I got an email five minutes before I came down here uh, this evening from one of the smartest women I know, my wife. <laughs> and she said, I just read your horoscope. You've got to share it with the audience. So. What's your sign? I am Taurus, as is my wife. Imagine that. My horoscope for today says you will be in the spotlight today. Hey. So far, so good. It's not about being noticed. It's about showing that your ideas and your way of looking at the world are worth following. Well, I couldn't resist sharing that, so something's going on up there. But um, we're going to talk about um, the age of aging, which is a phrase that I've coined um, to talk about what's going on in our world today, which is the trend, the biggest trend that nobody's talking about, which is aging. I'm going to Brussels next month to speak at a national trends conference. Everybody wants to talk about disruption, valid trend. Everybody wants to talk about digitalization, valid trend. But the aging of the world is the trend that no one's paying attention to and is having a pervasive effect on national economies, uh, human health, and social welfare. Uh, companies like uh, countries like Germany, Italy, Japan, China, just phenomenal rates of aging. What we're going to focus on today is the market that matters most to you, which is the U.S. <coughs> market. And we're going to start by getting at this notion of aging. I've only used the word old once in the five years that I've um, since I founded Boom Majors, and I used it to write the book called The Old Rush because I couldn't resist the soundbite. But you're going to hear me dance around the topic of aging, talk about people of age, talk about marketing to age, talk about generational marketing, but you will not hear me talk about people being old. Right? So we're going to start with, um, you thought that the cocktail party was going to be the interactive part of the evening, right? <laughs> yeah, look at this crazy nice big aisle for me here. I can even walk in over here. These mobile mics are great too. Show of hands for baby boomers in the room, born between 46 and 64. Get them up there, be proud. Hi. Aging is good. See, stay keep working up. All right, now we're going to ask you your weight. No, uh, how about millennials? Get them up there. I will promise that this is a fair, balanced discussion. Um, but I do know that the millennials, if I could ask anything, most often, it's this boomers or millennials, and we'll get into that tomorrow with round tables. But what is aging? You know, I, I, I joke to break the ice and say, you know, aging is when you choose your cereal for the uh, fiber and not the prize. <laughs> and all the young people laugh, and the baby boomers are all sort of going, hmm. or when you don't recognize the people in a people magazine anymore. That happened to you. Anyway, uh, we'll get at a definition of aging later um, that the baby boomers <coughs> use that's, that speaks to this notion of getting better with age. Um, but we're going to start and dive right into gold. Obviously, gold is good for business. Uh, I've spoken at several conferences over the years on this. Uh, who doesn't love gold? I tried to wear as much as I could today. <laughs> My Cartier ring. Um, but gold is good for business. You all know that. But it's going through a correction. Right? Gold used to be growth, growth, growth. You'd see fluctuations when commodity prices uh, moved. But well, we're going through a correction now for sure, and that's probably putting it mildly. But it's not about the gold. Let's not pick on gold. Gold is what it's always been and always will be. It's incredibly irresistible, timeless. The allure of it is just unbelievable. But it's about the marketers and the buyers. People selling gold and the people buying gold. And as you all know, because you're here to make markets for the next two days, you can't have, you can't sell things that people don't want to buy it. And we're going to get out all these dynamics and try to get behind uh, the precious metal and understand <coughs> what's driving it. And part of that is generational choices. Because I believe what's happening out there right now is that marketing is missing the target because marketing is overemphasizing millennials and it's underemphasizing boomers. <laughs> so I call millennials the generational perfect storm. I'll highlight in a moment four factors that are driving some of the discomfort that we all have in trying to market to them. But remember that everything I'm about to share with you is taking place in a business context that is unlike anything we've ever seen before, right? You've heard about the VUCA world, the volatility, 
uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, all those things are true. The globalization, the interconnectedness of markets, Brexit. Uh, we won't talk about politics, but obviously we have a political context that is very, very real right now. All of that going on around it, and within it, you've got the millennial generation creating this convergence of forces that's bringing turbulence to the markets. I'm using this metaphor because the people that I talk to, and, and Joe talked about pain points before, uh, when I wrote my first book, The Old Rush, I was a little naive as, a, as somebody who started a business. I thought, I'll just evangelize and let people know that marketing to age is like the gold rush. That if you get there first, there's big nuggets on the ground. If you wait and follow others, you're going to pan and dig for dust. They're out there. It's uncontested. It's under leverage. Go get rich quickly. And everybody, you know, the old boiled frog, everybody said, no, 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 got it. Never done that before. Not going to do it now. Right? But nobody really moved on that prospect, pardon the pun, until they started to experience some pain. So four years after I wrote that book, everybody's calling me now saying, I can't figure out these millennials, what do I do now? I just had an article published last week in Forbes, I'd encourage you to, to Google it, about what can Wall Street, what can Madison Avenue learn from Wall Street, how to market to a diversified generational portfolio. Marketing to 100% millennials is like putting all of your money in emerging markets. Who in this room would invest 100% of the money in emerging markets? But let's check down the list. Diminutive purchasing power. We'll go through that in terms of their income, their expenses, etc. Divergent values. They may not necessarily be divergent values per se from their boomer parents, but the values are coming to life in a very different context than the values that we had. True fact, 92% of millennials say their boomer parents are their best friends. Right. The values are the same, they're manifesting themselves differently. Right. I would not have called my father, great, great man, would not have called him my best friend. Respected him, feared him, yes, best friend, no. Preference to share versus own, really, really big issue, and we'll get into the access economy in a moment. And a preference to click to buy, which is a real problem if you're a bricks and mortar operation. Everybody's pulling their hair out trying to figure out what to do about the changing retail landscape, what's next. Nobody really knows what's next. All I know is there's nowhere to hide, right? It seems like every Monday I wake up, there's something else in the news about Tiffany and turmoil there, um, as if they needed Trump to set up the, uh, the White House North next to their store, which certainly doesn't help. But um, Tiffany, in, in my mind, sort of epitomizes what's going on here uh, in your industry because it's a brand that, that baby boomers growing up, it was the ultimate symbol, the ultimate way to give a gift. Um, and now it's a brand uh, with a rotating leadership trying to figure out what it wants to do. Ralph Lauren, same thing. Um, so we're gonna sh share some facts. Instead of just saying, hey, they're a perfect storm and millennials are turbulent, we're gonna get into some facts about the millennials. And coming out of that, take a pause, Make sure you're all with me on the journey philosophically of where we're going here. And then we'll dive into baby boomers, some insights into what's going on, how to think about generational marketing. And I'll even give you some answers in terms of how to think about <coughs> restaging your businesses and going after boomers in this late stage when you might think that they've saturated jewelry collections. So let's start with the facts about millennials. And these all come from uh, reputable sources, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, National Marketing Institute. Um, 81 million of them in the US, largest generation um, that's alive today. Baby boomers were only 80 million at their height. Two billion of them worldwide. Um, they're new, they're large, digitally native, socially connected, the future of consumption. Everybody in my business advertising, all they want to do is win for these millennials because they love all the cool stuff that ad agency people and marketing people and people in Hollywood get to do. We can live stream it, we can do this, we can do that. They represent the future of consumption. What I hear all the time is, hey, I have to make a choice in, in targeting my marketing. I have to decide between Gen X or baby boomers or millennials. And if it really comes down to how I allocate my limited resources, I'm gonna put it against the millennials because they represent the future of my brand. I had this conversation, I created the best part of waking up this folders in your cup some 30 years ago. I went to see Maxwell House, and I said, um, have you guys, 
you know, looked at you know what's going on with changing dynamics within the home, with baby boomers retiring at the rate of 10,000 a day for the next 15 years, and they're exiting the traditional workforce and workplace, and they're coming home, right? You guys are Maxwell Hacks, right? What are you doing to think about your coffee, that cup of coffee that used to be consumed in haste on the way to the car or in the office or on the way to the office, right? That coffee, that morning ritual, that best part of waking up is now gonna take place in the home. We're moving towards a home-centric world. What are you all at Maxwell House doing about that? And they said, well, we're trying to win with millennials and we've got these new lattes coming out and everything because millennials represent our future. And I challenge everybody who says that, millennials represent my future because if I can win them today, I own them, their loyalty for a lifetime. I ask them to step back and challenge their assumptions about loyalty, right? All of the assumptions, best practices, philosophies, tools, and approaches in modern marketing today are the result of marketing to the baby boomers for the last 30 years. We put the mass in mass marketing, okay? and very few people have true experience in doing anything else. So, <coughs> what's happening here is the potential of this generation is so staggering, the desire to win with them, have them for a lifetime, is so staggering that it's seductive. I'm seeing people who haven't even done fundamental research, going out and conducting focus groups with affluent millennials and finding out there simply aren't enough of them to buy what they need to sell simply aren't enough out there. Uh, it's distorting reality. And the reality of the phrase that I've coined is, yes, they may represent the future of marketing, but the future isn't here yet. I prognosticate the future for millennials is a good five to 15 years away. I've addressed groups before, and I've said, what are you gonna do for the next five to 15 years? What's your strategy? Here's the facts. The first are not going to enter their peak earning and spending years until 2020. The bulk not until 2030. 75% can only afford to buy what they need, not what they want. This was research that we fielded in conjunction with the National Marketing Institute. Very, very concerning number when you're selling something like jewelry, which you do not need. You want it, you crave it, you desire it, you do not need it. 75%. Think about that. 45% are not employed, right? You still have a significant number of these millennials. Let's remember their age, right? Born between 80 and, and 2000, they're still in college. But that doesn't mean they can't find a job. They're not ready for a job yet. 23% have college debt, and that number's rising. I am pleased to see, by the way, that some of the major universities are running accelerated programs to allow some of the youth of today to get through university faster with less debt. 40% still receive financial assistance from their boomer parents, right? <laughs> yeah. Still trying to get my 28-year-old daughter off my cell phone plan. Um, and here's another very concerning one for your industry. They're postponing milestones. Marriage, let's just start with that, right? Postponing marriage uh, from the age 23 in 1970 to 30, um, which has major implications. I call this air in the pipes. Right? The baby boomers aren't getting married, they're getting divorced, okay? So where's all of that stage-based marketing, right? I talk about the majority of marketing is, is either to age or stage. You know, we espouse a belief that you should market to values because values endure irrespective of age or stage throughout a lifetime. But most marketing, as we have known it, is age or stage. I'm gonna market to a young man when he's shaving for the first time, and if he uses a Gillette razor, he will use it for the rest of his life. Same thing with Crest toothpaste or Colgate toothpaste, okay? So marketing uses these apertures, these developments in life, these rituals, as targets to market to, yet what happens when targets move in and people are getting married later? It'll work itself out of the system at some point, but I get back to this question of what are you gonna do for the next five to 15 years? And this is a really, really concerning one. The must-haves are not as important. Look at these numbers. Look at the numbers for luxury items. Indifferent, not a priority. I was up at Orvis. I'm a big fly fisherman. It's the coolest meeting I've ever had in my life. I said, even if nothing comes to the meeting, I had a meeting in the Trout Conference Room at Orvis up in Manchester, Vermont. Um, 
and they said, we can't even get them to buy a $100 sweater, yet alone a $750 fly rod. Yet, we found out that our kids are going to Zermatt to go skiing and whatever, whatever. They're making different choices. Um, and I, for one, don't want to be in the business of trying to predict what their choices are going to be. So, if that's not concerning, there's more. There's this pesty little thing called the access economy, sharing versus owning. What the numbers I just shared with you reflect is a generational bias to not have to have the must-haves. If I can get access to them, if I can borrow them, if I can share them, I get the same experience. In fact, I'm a leg up because my parents had to have the money I don't have to be able to acquire. I'm smarter, I can access. We've gone from acquisition to access. These guys are probably tallying the numbers from last week on Valentine's Day, as is everybody else. How did everybody do on Valentine's? I'm willing to bet that these guys cleaned up on Valentine's Day with millennials who were all bound for some type of experience event and didn't want to take a bus to get there because they could spend the money on an Uber. Or how about couch surfing? Even better than Airbnb, you get to stay with the people who own the house. So you can go to Poughkeepsie, New York and stay with the Clark family. <coughs> no thank you. <laughs> but they love it and it works. They're sharing, zip cars, wheels when you want them, of course. So these are all examples you know, but then it comes to your industry. I'm not even in your business. I'm putting this presentation together and I'm shaking. It's easy, rent, receive, look, fab, return. Ha <laughs> <laughs> Wanna laugh again? Yeah. <laughs> it's easy, it's easy. Uh, you know, you used to steal your mother's jewelry, now you don't have to anymore, right? Uh, if it ticks, sparkles, or shines, rent it. We'll put it in a beautiful box, box, box. Who needs the Tiffany box when we'll mail it to you like that? And my favorite, borrowed bling. Now we know what's been going on in Hollywood all these years. So what on earth do we do with all this? Is this making sense? Anybody struggling to embrace this? I think everybody's saying, yeah, we get it. And you're right, it is a perfect storm because we live in turbulent times as it is without trying to figure out this dynamic. Help me, what do we do about it, right? That's why we're all here. Starts by falling in love with boomers again. <coughs> and I made sure we found beautiful people wearing jewelry. 50% of the US population is 50 and older. They control 70% of disposable income. I don't care what business you're in. You could be Procter & Gamble selling bounty paper towels. And Charmin, you're looking at your data and it's saying 50% of your business is 50 and older. The Gillette people told me they looked at global male grooming jobs, only, only Gillette would call them jobs. All around the world, 50% of male grooming related usage is men 50 plus. And they've got the money. Older adults spend, they love spending their money. They're about acquisition and ownership. 3.5 trillion is up 45% versus the prior decade. You can't take it with you. These are the best years of my life and we'll talk about aging, we'll talk about getting better with age. Oh, by the way, they stand to inherit 15 trillion. Mom and dad, not gonna live forever. 25% of them say they're not gonna retire. Why on earth would I do anything remotely resembling retiring? That's about stopping. I have no intention of stopping. And if I'm gonna continue to work, I'll continue to have money. I'm gonna continue to wanna look my best when I go to work. I may even need to look better than I did when I went to the workplace because now I'm on my own and trying to look even more impressive to people as I try to reimagine myself and start a new business. Women's Wear Daily put a $21 billion price tag on baby boomers in fashion. That's how much they're consuming. A line that they stole from me because I was interviewed in it. Ignore them at your peril. Peril. All right. My favorite numbers, longevity economy. They're actually people that measure the sum total of all economic output, output associated with adults 50 plus in our country. And when you add those numbers up, 
it totals $7.1 trillion a year. Now that economy associated with the segment of our population that nobody wants to be bothered with because they're old is larger than any other country's total economy in the world, with the exception of China. And remember the brick markets when the fascination was got to go with Brazil, Russia, India, China? That $7.1 trillion a year is larger than Russia, um, uh, Brazil, and India combined, which total only $6.3 trillion. So all these businesses trying to figure out how to deal with, with doing business in foreign countries and, and entry and politics and logistics, because that's where the fast growth was. They could have stayed right here in the United States where they know how to do business, where the infrastructure exists, where everything is straightforward, if all they did was shift their focus to 50 plus. Something happened in 2014, after years and years of marketing 18 to 49, the last of the baby boomers turned 50, Elvis left the building, right? Marketers are still fixated on 18 to 49, and all the, all the population, all the growth, all the money went this way. They're still locked down in 18 to 49, waiting for the millennials to come in the top of the funnel to make up for the boomers about the bottom of the funnel. They may be making up demographically, but they are not making up the difference in terms of purchasing power, and that's the pain point that everybody is feeling. It's as simple as understanding the demographics of the marketplace. So all those great things about baby boomers, and you know they love gold. They always have. They're not gonna stop loving gold. I actually had somebody say to me once, well, you know, those old people, doesn't it come down to you know, you're on that fixed income and you only have so much money and do you buy a piece of gold jewelry or do the hip replacement? I said, are you really having this conversation with me? Do you know anything about what this baby boomer generation is doing? Joe read the books, Joe knows what they're doing. So this was the, the first book and as I said earlier, I thought I could evangelize um, and make things happen but it wasn't until we experienced the pain point um, of businesses putting 100% of their investment against this generation of the future and then having nothing to show for it. Um, just last week, I got a phone call from the cotton people. Guess what? The cotton people can't sell expensive cotton right now. Right? What are millennials wearing? It, it doesn't matter what business you're in. Everybody is, is feeling this. Um, so let's get inside their heads and their hearts. Right? And when, the first thing you're going to need to know is when you get inside the baby boomer's head, this person who's aging, there's some really weird stuff going on there. <laughs> you know it. You know what you're doing if you're aging. Right? Baby boomers are the ones that, that created all the stigma around aging, and now that we are them, there's a double standard of play. These are the best years of my life. I'm going to get better with age. What are you talking about? Being 22 again? No way. I love being 57. People of age believe they're ageless. This quote here came in that a girl in our office is 50 and all of her friends are turning 50 this year. And one of them uh, wrote to invite uh, her friends to this beautiful place out in Utah. And she said, I'd love it if you could join me on an adventure to celebrate my half century mark. It seems surreal as I feel about 23 tops in my own mind. 50 year old saying she feels 23. That's just a random thing that came in. Um, and they believe the older they get, the younger they feel. There's data from the Pew uh, Research Organization um, that claims that um, most baby boomers believe that old age starts at 72. And the older you get, the younger you claim to feel, right? So when you're in your 50s and 60s, you claim to feel 10 years younger than your age. You get into your advanced 60s and 70s, you claim to feel 10 to 19 years younger than your age. You see what's going on here, right? You're never going to die. <laughs> right? And I call it the, when people ask me what age it is, I say it's not biological, it's psychological, and the psychology is irrational. Why is the psychology of aging irrational? It's irrational because the rational part of aging is really crummy. It's about morbidity and mortality, so the human brain is a beautiful thing. <coughs> it's wired to defend itself against unpleasant scenarios. So instead, we substitute it for, these are the best years of my life. I feel younger than I've ever felt. I'm absolutely convinced, age 57, that I feel better than I did during my 40s. I actually believe they're getting better with age, and I wrote a book about that. 
I'm not looking for the fountain of youth because I'm not old. There's a great Carl Lagerfeld line, which is the easiest way to look old is to try to look young. I don't have to look young because I'm not old. This is the biggest mistake we see people make day in, day out. Oh, the baby boomers want to turn back time. They want to be young. They want, you know, wrinkle-free skin. No, they want to live their best life. I call it quality of longevity. It used to be as a quality of life for my about longevity. I went to see the doctor the other day and I noticed they had a new sign behind the reception area and now it says life extension clinic. I'm going, yeah, that's why I'm here. Isn't that why we all go to the doctor proactively? Just try to squeeze out a few more years. And I call that quality of longevity. I'm not gonna gradually deteriorate or erode over time. I'm gonna chug along just the way I am now and then boom, one day I won't be here. <laughs> This is the irrational psychology of aging. So, so we chuckle, but start to think about how that affects choices around acquisition and consumption. If I feel better than I did when I was in my 40s, I want to dress better. I want to look better, feel better. Everything I do is all about that quality of life, and jewelry fits right into that if you choose to prioritize this group. They define aging as the future of living, so I joked before, but when you ask a baby boomer what aging is, they say the future of living. Two really fascinating things going on in that sentence. They are future focused. Oh my God, the baby boomers are in their, between the ages of 52 and 70. How could you possibly be focused on the future? Don't buy green bananas. You're old, you're gonna die. What do you mean you're focused on the future? You're old. Right? Average age of an advertising agency employee is 27. This is what they think about when they're asked to do work for this generation. Um, living, I'm not stopping. I'm gonna live. I'm gonna live with a vengeance. I'm gonna uh, learn, grow, discover, explore, push. Have you ever heard of the term boomeritis? <laughs> boomeritis is the term that the medical industry had to come up with uh, about five or 10 years ago to describe the consequences of engaging in physical activity that are inappropriate for your age. <laughs> right? And guess when the most uh, diagnoses are done? What day of the week? Monday, Monday morning. So I always say to groups of, of baby boomers, you, you bike 30 miles on Saturday, and on Saturday night your legs are on fire, your back hurts, you're in agony. You say to yourself, one of two things, I'm getting too old to exercise that aggressively, I need to find some other activity, or darn it, I can't believe I'm that out of shape, I better bike 35 tomorrow. What's the right answer? Yeah, everybody says I'm gonna bike 35. It doesn't make any sense. As quantity of life remaining decreases, they increase focus on quality of life. Can't take it with you. I'm gonna get as most out of this as I can. I'm not getting old, they're growing old. So, let's really get down to this part of the presentation that I know you're most eager to get at. And again, I encourage you to reach out to me tomorrow during the day. That's what I'm here for. If you'd like to talk specifically about your businesses. Um, what I'm gonna do here is to give you um, not answers because that would be too easy. You get paid a lot of money to do what you're doing and you know, I can't come out here and give you the answers for free. But I will tell you where to look for the answers. I will tell you the questions to ask. And, and as Joe said earlier, I look at things, 35 year career advertising guy, I look at things <laughs> through the lens of how can I modify or positively influence people's perceptions to get them to buy more of what it is I'm trying to sell. So I'm not a gerontologist, I'm not a futurist, I'm not an author spewing philosophy. I'm a marketing and advertising person, so everything I'm about to share with you goes through that filter. And I think that's why you're here, but marketing uh, generationally. To get them, right, to get them to buy what you're selling, you're gonna need to get them, as in you're gonna have to really really, really understand them. And here's the first hurdle. 
by virtue of their age, the baby boomers have been on the receiving end of more marketing and advertising than any other generation. Right? Think about buying a car. The first car I ever bought, that car salesman owned me. It was ugly. Okay? But now I've probably bought 20 or more cars in the course of my lifetime, and I know how to get a good bargain on the car. I know when an advertiser is trying to blow something by me. Um, we've learned, uh, coincidentally, uh, all the people in influence marketing who are starting to focus on people of age have discovered that celebrities don't work anymore. And why do you think that is? It's not like we stopped loving celebrities. We've gotten smarter over the years with the fact that I know why they're using that celebrity. They're trying to suggest to me that they think that I think I can be more like that person, and that's a bunch of you know what. So you're really, really gonna have to get them and, and at the root of everything you're doing, when people say to me, what is the, the one thing we need to do to succeed in winning baby boomers? It's authenticity. You have to be really, really authentic. You have to have a pithy, pithy understanding of why they're thinking and acting the way they are, and you have to present yourself in the truest, most sincerest fashion that you can. <laughs> one false note, savvy audience, it's over. The first one is don't sell them gold, get them to buy gold, right? This, this is a universal. And the other thing is baby boomers like myself, I talk a lot about there are smart people in business, right? A lot of young, smart people. Um, what they lack through no fault of their own is experience. The baby boomers have the combination of, of um, uh, intellect, intellect and experience, which adds up to wisdom, okay? You're gonna have to understand what it is about them that is gonna create the demand and the interest as opposed to here's what I'm gonna sell and if I describe it artfully, they will buy it. You have to flip this equation the other way. Don't sell by telling, they have to feel something. Remember that people of age don't process information cognitively the same way that younger people do, right? I, um, I just got a Fitbit. I've been walking a lot because I moved and I walked to the train station and skiing and I wanted just to sort of track. I was just curious, how many steps do I take in a day? And I, I ended up writing a blog saying I'm not fit for my Fitbit because I couldn't even activate it. And, and I got mad that uh, I finally took it back into the store and they said, well, did you um, try um, syncing it up through your laptop? I said, no, because the device plays out on the app on the phone. So I synced it with the app, and nowhere in the instructions did it tell me, try your computer. But the point being is we process information differently. Cognitive psychologists would tell you that we are burdened by the ability to process this much information in a complex world. But the old Maya Angelou quote, I won't always remember what you said or did, but I will remember the way it made me feel. This is the business that you're in with this audience. Make them feel something. I like to use the phrase inspire to create desire, right? You all know this better than I do because you're in the jewelry business day in, day out. You are in the business of desire. How do you create that? You can't tell them to desire it. You can make them feel desire, but I think the best ingredient is inspire to create desire. People always say, well, do you show up? Everybody wants to bore it down to the banal things. Do you show the baby boomer in the advertising that's the age she is? Or do you show a younger woman? Or do you show an older woman? What, what woman do you put in the ad? Um, and I keep saying, you have to put the aspirationally authentic image in there. It's a beautiful, almost oxymoron, but aspirationally authentic. That's what they respond to. They respond to people like them. Mentioned a moment ago, celebrities don't work anymore with baby boomers. What's working? People like me, who I respect, trust, and admire, who I can relate to in some positive way. Um, Lisa Konigsberg was kind enough to suggest that I read this book, which is, if you have not read Asia Raiden's book about um, how jewelry obsession and desire has shaped the world, please do. She looks at the, uh, the uh, history of the world through this lens of wanting, taking, and having. Think about all the great wars that have been about wanting land or resource, taking it, having it, not being able to keep it. 
you have to understand how to create desire. Help them dream. We've talked a lot about how irrational they are. They are dreamers, right? Remember, I touched on generational values just a little bit. My value that describes me best and is also a dominant value for the baby boomer generation is optimism. I grew up in the 1960s. We had just defeated sinister enemies in World War II. We had gone to the brink with Fidel Castro, the Cuban Missile Crisis. We put a man on the moon. And I watched my father. I grew up on a dairy farm. My father was the first in his family to go to university, and he went to an Ivy League school. I grew up believing that anything was possible with hard work. And I still continue to dream every single day, especially when my horoscope tells me it's OK. But understand that they're dreaming. Help them dream. Do not accept that their life is finite. Do not accept that their budgets are limited. Do not accept that the jewelry collections are saturated. They are still dreaming, and they will dream right down to the day they no longer dream. Be sure you really know what gold is. Right? This is something that I take for granted as being in the advertising business for 35 years, but I learned on day one on the job, in 1981, the Peter Revson quote of in the factory, we make perfume in the department stores, we sell hope. That is how, I don't care what it is you're selling, if you're selling screwdrivers for a living, you've got to understand the difference between what it is you make in the factory and what it is that people are buying. People aren't buying screwdrivers, they're buying solutions to something that needs to be repaired. Understand the solution mindset. Understand what gold is really doing to transform the way this person feels about themselves. Things of beauty validate her desired self-image. Now this seems basic, right? We've always sort of known that, that uh, what you wear is an expression of self and desired self-image and so forth. But now you've got people in their 60s and 70s and they're aging and they're bringing sensitivity to their age and they're, every day they're reshaping what their self-image is. We'll talk in a moment about some stages of aging um, where you start to, to um, realize that you're of age, you start to reflect, et cetera. But we have to understand what her desired self-image is. You're not gonna find these things just by sitting in your office and dreaming them up. You're gonna have to get out there and talk to her. Um, I think it comes down to an imperative that's as simple as this which is that gold is a timeless allure for an ageless generation. You heard about the uh, Coachella concert that took place out here, the, uh, the Baby Boomer concert, Rolling Stones. Um, if you play a clip of that, it is the most horrible music you've ever heard in your life. I, I, don't get me wrong, I admire the Rolling Stones and everything they've done, but artistically right now, it's just it's not good music. That's not why the baby boomers went there and spent the kind of money they did to make it the highest grossing concert event ever. They went because watching the Stones helped them feel ageless. <coughs> it wasn't about music, so back to what are you selling? What they were selling was an ageless experience. I talked a moment ago about the stage of age. Right now she's at a stage of reflection. She's lived a good life. There's actually scientific proof that there's joy in aging. Why is there joy in aging? Because you, as opposed to chasing the next station in life, which you've done, gotta find somebody to marry, right? go to the right school, find someone to marry, get a great job, rise the ladder, live the Western lifestyle, right? All those years of striving, now suddenly you can look back on your life and say, um, I've accumulated wisdom, knowledge, confidence, uh, I'm confident I can do things. I don't live with fear of doing things anymore. I'm comfortable with my relationships. I finally figured out life. My grandfather, dairy farmer, full of a Yankee ingenuity, used to say, by the time you figure it all out, you run out of time. But most, most baby boomers have figured it all out. So now she's reflecting. And she's saying, I've lived a good life. What do I have to do to leave a lasting legacy? I don't know about you, but I came up with an idea on the way out here, and maybe somebody's already doing it, but I feel like everybody 
my age that I know has about three chests of silver that came from some grandma in the family. And it's ugliest looking stuff, but nobody parts with it because it's heirloom silver. And I said, what if you just could send your heirloom silver? Most of us don't even know which grandmother on which side of the family owned it. The initials don't even tie into the family <laughs> initials. But we hang on to it because it's silver and it's family silver. But what if I could melt it all down and do something good with that? I could maybe even do something good for somebody else with it. It's certainly not bringing me any utility. But people are starting to say, what's my lasting legacy going to be? Um, and I saw this, uh, I'm not very familiar with this brand, but I saw this ad at the Time Warner Center with a mother and her two daughters with charm bracelets. And I said, I don't know if they knew what they were doing when they did that ad, but in terms of that mother reflecting on her legacy, what can I pass down? What do I have? What are the things that I've done that I can share? What do I have in common with my daughters? Is there anything that hits that sweet spot of that psychology better than a charm bracelet? A charm bracelet that represents the accumulation of a life well lived at the point in time when she's looking to leave a lasting legacy? It's just one simple example, and I know that people are, are getting excited about selling small trinkets to millennials like Alex and Annie and so forth, but there should be no end to what she wants to do with her charm bracelet, and how can me and my daughter <coughs> be on the same page with how we catalog our lives with gold. The last thing she wants to do, to my way of thinking, is to be remembered for her heirlooms. Right? That's the other thing that happens. My wife dumps this box of gold junk on the bed, and there's all these brooches and pins and bad bracelets that have belonged to all these relatives. They're heirlooms. They don't have any value, but they could have value because they're beautiful gold and they were beautiful in their time. I leave you with this thought. Baby boomers love the word re at a point in time when they are doing anything but retiring. They are reimagining, rethinking, rewiring, right? My dream, right? I talked earlier about dreaming. My dream when I'm done doing this is to rewire and get back to my blue collar roots and learn how to be a carpenter. Sounds wacky, but I've always wanted to be a carpenter. But I'm thinking about the re, I'm always thinking next about what I can do. I, so I've told you, if you can help them dream, make them feel something, do it with somebody who's aspirationally authentic, a woman like me, and you can get some change of statement, think about it. If, if your psychology is saying age is about stasis, best case, or degradation, worst case, okay? If I can constantly be reading, I'm moving myself towards a better place. I'm focused on self-improvement. Remember, it's a very self-driven generation. I'm focused on self-improvement because I'm not getting old, I am growing old. So anything that you can bring to them with re, I was a small jewelry store, I would be looking to get everything she owns on my store counter, figure out how to refurbish, restore, and repurpose what she has so she can share it with others, feel better about what she owns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, that's thinking differently about what gold is, how to self-disrupt your business, because if you don't self-disrupt your business, the world will disrupt it even more than it is already but thinking differently about you know, what it is, what is gold, um, if it's not just another new bracelet. So there you have it. Um, and I'm sensitive to the fact that uh, it is cocktail hour and I'm the entertainment <laughs> that is uh, standing in the way of the real entertainment. But I didn't know whether you wanted to. Um, okay, does anybody have any questions? questions or, and again, we have tomorrow. I do have a quick question for you, but I think you, partially answered it in your last slide was, uh, is there an intersection of millennials and boomers where you know they kind of are looking for the same thing, where, where the same message would impact them? I was thinking about that question, but then I saw your slide on the legacy, and that yeah. seems to have hit home, um, but I was wondering if there are any others. You know, people come to us, great question, Joe. People come to us, and um, we had a, a small uh, regional bank came to us, and I mean, they're really getting hammered. The, the big banks and, and uh, millennials um, have a very limited financial aptitude. 70% um, uh, of them fail a basic <laughs> financial test. And they're saying, uh, you know, they don't even own checks anymore. 
right? How am I gonna get them to come into my store with a bricks and mortar relationship? And what we focused on was how we can get these two generations to come together. I call it building a generational bridge, replacing the generational gap with a generational bridge. There's absolutely, I'm convinced, infinite ways to think about getting mothers and daughters to think the same way about gold and to approach it together with mom's wisdom, knowledge, experience, the assets that she owns that she might want to share, et cetera. I would think that she would be the number one focus as, as a way in to build a generational bridge to millennials. If you're in this either or mentality of I gotta focus on one or the other and I don't really wanna focus on the old people because they're gonna die soon and then my competition will have one with millennials and one with nothing, that's not gonna work. What we're seeing is that most uh, smart markers out there right now are saying I need a gap strategy. I need something that I can execute for the next five to 15 years that allows me to buy time and grow my business until the millennials come online and the boomers don't say it, start to leave the world. It's been mostly about she, she, she. How do you bring he into it? <laughs> um, you know, I'm reluctant in this category to bring him into it. Um, just because even though you've tried for years to educate him and make him feel smarter, take the risk out of buying jewelry for his wife, um, I don't think the leopard spots get changed easily. So I believe it's all about creating desire with her, and he may be the one that goes in and buys it, but I think it begins with her. Um, uh, and I, I just tend to, in general, I'm of the belief that women are more influential in a lot of purchase decisions than we give them credit for. Um, I have a question about your question. Um, did you mean he um, in the way Peter was responding, or did you mean he as in um, the jewelry male owner? market for, for jewelry for yeah, men? Yeah, decision maker or owner. And then the whole watch thing too with, with where that's going with phones. Um, by the way, I heard somebody say the other day, you know, when you get somebody tells you, well, uh, oh, over there, 10 o'clock. Most people don't even understand that anymore because of what's happening. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, you said that you were going to talk about Okay, everybody, uh, the cocktails and dinner, you're going to make a left outside the door, and then a left through the last room, down the stairs, and you'll just follow the signs to the right. It's past the whale factory, and it's 